and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we're releasing a bonus episode. This is my recent appearance on the Low Carb and Fasting YouTube channel with Nairi Misisian. This was an interview that I gave last month and was released on April 30th, 2023. In this conversation, I talked a lot about my experience with fitness, uh, my understanding of nutrition and low carbohydrate nutrition in particular, and how I found that and started leveraging that not only for myself, but also for my clients, and also how I found intermittent fasting as a tool that works wonders for all kinds of different things with health. If you recognize the name, Nairi was hosted on our show back on episode 437. It was a wonderful episode. I'd highly recommend going back to hear her story. We released that one on April 3rd of 2023. We really discussed her approach to low carbohydrate diets and fasting and how she uses it to help her control her type one diabetes, which we know now is very, very effective. So anyway, please check out this episode, check out her channel. Make sure you subscribe to that channel. She does wonderful work. She hosts lots of really great guests, some of which we've interviewed as well. And without further ado, here is my interview on the Low Carb and Fasting YouTube channel. Part of what I was doing in my career, the one thing that I was trained on is, is learning how to use what is called a metabolic cart, which basically measures people's metabolism or how many calories that people burn. But then also they would feel like their motivation levels were really low. They were really hungry. Their cravings were increasing. They were getting frustrated that the weight loss that was working really well in the beginning was no longer working. And they would quit. Eventually, everybody would quit. If you have not taken care of your physical body and your bones, you're not going to have the muscle mass to stop you from falling. And once you fall, your bones are going to be brittle. You're probably going to break your hip or your leg. And that's game over for a lot of people. That's the end. Hello, everyone. This is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Well, on this channel, we talk about nutrition. We talk about uh, the science of health. But we haven't yet talked about fitness. Uh, We've covered fitness in a few episodes, but we haven't dedicated a full episode to, uh, to fitness and exercise. So today's guest has been in the fit in the fitness industry for 15 years he's actually a certified uh personal trainer but also a certified nutritionist so to combine those two sort of knowledge from those two fields together uh makes him quite unique in his approach he works alongside his wife bethany who couldn't be with us today and they address their clients obviously fitness and health um Casey Roth, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Hi, Neri. Thank you so much for hosting me. It's an honor to chat with you again. Casey, I'm really delighted to have you. We're going to dedicate this episode to just, you know, fitness. I haven't covered much on on this channel, so I'm very excited to have you with us today. Um, Casey, when uh, you first started as a personal trainer? When did I first start? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, when you first started. 15 years ago or so. So uh, your focus was on calories and weight loss primarily, right? It was. Uh, Can you tell our audience why it wasn't effective? So your clients weren't necessarily getting healthier when you were focusing on calories. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's funny to look back on like 15, 16 years ago when I first got started, my boss called me a uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed and I was so excited to get started. And the day I got my certification was the last day. I think I was ever an expert in anything since then it's been unlearning and unlearning and unlearning all kinds of stuff that I thought I knew perfectly for that first day, uh, you know? So yeah, we, we had at the time, this is back in 2007, we had an idea that, you know, basically it was the same message as most people know. If you if you wanted to gain weight, you had to eat more calories than you burned. And if you wanted to lose weight, you just had to flip it. You needed to eat less calories than what you burn. And that could work both ways. That could be you eating less calories, or it could be you burning more calories. And so part of what I was doing in my career, the one thing that I was trained on is, is learning how to use what is called a metabolic cart, which basically measures people's metabolism or how many calories that people burn. 
not only while they are exercising, like I think a lot of people would recognize like when somebody's on a bike or a treadmill, they're wearing a mask and they're pushing themselves really hard and they find out their VO2 max. That's essentially kind of the testing that we were doing. Um, but we would also do it when somebody would be resting. And so that would tell you at a baseline level, if you're doing nothing other than sitting in a chair, how many calories is your baseline metabolism burning? And then we would extrapolate it to 24 hours. So how many calories does it take for your brain to work and for your heart to pump and muscle on your body needs calories just to be there. And so we would use that test as an equation to help tell people like, okay, if you're burning 1500 calories at rest, when you have your job and all the other calories you burn in a day, maybe that's 2000 calories. And maybe you come to the gym and you burn 500 calories on the treadmill, we assume that you're burning maybe 2,500 calories every single day. So if you eat 2,500 calories, I'd expect your weight to be about the same. If you wanted to lose weight, you would just have to eat about 500 calories less than the 2,500 every single day. And one pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So 500 calorie deficit multiplied by seven days would be 3,500 calories, one pound. So you should be able to do that every single week for as many weeks as you had pounds to lose. You just keep exercising, you know, mostly like a treadmill where you could run and sweat and, you know, burn lots of calories because the treadmill says you burn a lot of calories. Um, and then you have low calorie foods, like lots of vegetables and lots of whole grains and lots of things that in theory would have kept you full. And, and the thing is it would work. It really would work for people if they would do a calorie deficit, they would lose weight for sure. But the weight they would lose would not be, it would not be just fat. It would lose all kinds of weight. So all you know, some fat, but also some lean tissue, which you don't want to lose. You would lose maybe some connective tissue or bone density um, because your body's just in a deficit and you'd lose weight. But the problem is the weight loss would really slow down over time and then people would plateau. But then also they would feel like their motivation levels were really low. They were really hungry. Their cravings were increasing. They were getting frustrated that the weight loss that was working really well in the beginning was no longer working. And they would quit. Eventually, everybody would quit. And they would think that they were a failure because they quit. And it, to them, they look out and see other people that maybe you're not quitting or maybe they're in different parts of that same cycle and they feel like a failure. And then they start gaining weight. But the problem is they don't gain weight back to where they started. It's always that they gain weight like 10 pounds heavier than when they started losing weight to begin with. So it's an even worse situation. And what people don't understand is that when you put yourself in a chronic caloric deficit where you know, you're know you burning 2,500 calories and eating 2,000 calories, over time, your body will adjust. And it will adjust its that, that number we were talking about, the resting metabolic rate, the number of calories that your body needs to stay alive will decrease. And so your body won't be as energetic. It will save its calories. It will cool down, literally make your temperature um, lower. It will um, really reduce your motivation to burn any calories and it will increase your hunger because it's, it's craving more of that food. So it can kind of boost itself back up. And then it's really well suited to store the calories that it gets from fat because it wants a reserve of calories for the next time that, that, that you can't find enough food. Or you go on a diet, you're basically just telling your body that you're in a famine. And so a really good example that I give people is like, if I told you that this year economically would be really tough, um, would you go buy the Ferrari or would you start a savings account? And most people would say like, okay, if it's going to be economically tough, I'm going to start saving money. I'm not going to spend money on things I don't really need. Your body does the same thing when in a caloric deficit. If you're exercising too much or eating too less, your body knows that you're in save mode. You want to be in economy mode. So it'll slow your burn rate down and hold on to everything that you get. And so that was the frustrating thing. And that's what, what we were doing as trainers is trying to burn the maximum amount of calories in workouts, eat you know, the least amount of calories that we thought wouldn't crash somebody's metabolic rate, but people would just fail and they would feel bad about themselves. And then they'd come back the next year and try it again and they'd fail again. And it's, it's just like the Jason Fung thing. We're blaming victims of really bad advice versus questioning the advice that we're giving people. So that was kind of how we started. And yes, we focused a lot on calories in calories out and it just, it was never a long-term fix. And so it was very frustrating. Yeah, it must have been because, but you know, when you explain it like that. By the way, I love the uh, the analogy of uh, of the Ferrari and the savings account. But when you explain a calorie cal calorie sort of in and out concept, it makes so much sense. It makes 
and life so simple that everyone can understand, right? <laughs> and this is why I think that myth has lasted so long because everyone can understand it. It makes sense to almost everyone. So, um, but I think the, science, the new science is emerging now when people are becoming more aware and they're understanding that this calorie counting calories doesn't really work because it's all about the type of food you're eating how much of it you're eating, the nutrients your body is receiving. So um, so what approach do you use with your clients now? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll start with nutrition. I know we're talking mostly exercise today, but I want to start with nutrition because it was so interesting when we were um, at the gym, we were also doing weight loss contests for people. Um, so it was a program that our corporate gym was running and they made a lot of money with it. So they would sign up for what would be like a 90 day weight loss contest where you, you get a group of people, every trainer was assigned a certain amount of people. They would be given, you know, our, our participants would be given a packet of information with lots of recipes and shopping lists and workout programs. And we'd try to help them along for 90 days to help them to lose weight. There's a lot of that same paradigm. Let's get you lots of vegetables and lots of fruits and lots of lean meats and avoid the fats and that, that kind kind of thing. And again, the gym made a lot of money. And so over time, they switched it to instead of being 90 days that we would do twice a year, they ended up doing 60 days and they could do it four times a year. So we had to do this contest with new people every four months, um, every three months, excuse me. And I do mean new people, we'd have to go find new people because the failure rate was so high. It was somewhere around 85% of people that started the contest wouldn't even stand on the scale at the end of the contest, regardless of whether they were successful with weight loss or not. And so if you if you paid for that contest once, you 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 would fail it and you wouldn't likely really do it again because you know it kind of didn't work. So for trainers, for us, you know, we're working 100 percent commission and we're trying to find new people to do this program that our company's making us do, like it's it was really tough, it's frustrating. And, and financially, if nothing else, hard, hard to make a living that way. And nobody wants to do the same program. And we had a participant one year, this was in 2018, who um, I, I would listen to his diet. And I just recognized that he wasn't eating hardly any fat. He was snacking on carbohydrates all day and, and also all night. He would wake up in the middle of the night to eat cold cereal because he was so hungry all the time. He had about 25 pounds to lose. And so I told him like, let's, let's get a little bit more fat in your diet and see if that helps make you a little bit more full. And he did. And he came back in two days and said, Hey, like I just lost a pound and a half and I feel really good. What is this keto stuff? And I was like, interesting. I, I've heard of it. I think I saw it in a magazine at a grocery store or something, but I don't know that much about it. So let me learn about it. And that sent me on my journey through, you know, low carbohydrate diets and ketogenic diets and eventually carnivore diets. And what we would do in these contests is we would give people low carbohydrate meal plans rather than give people the company's meal plans. And nobody knew that we were doing it. Like my company didn't know that, that Bethany and I were doing our own little like rogue thing. We were giving people different information. We were doing free seminars to teach people like, this is why you failed before. It's not your fault, but it's your, your responsibility. We're going to give you different meals that are going to focus more on proteins and fats. And we want you to eat them until you're really, really, really full. And these people that signed up for this contest with us, where we were doing our own thing and giving people low carbohydrate meal plans was super successful. It was really quite amazing. We always had a, a winner in our contest. People didn't tend to gain weight in the time between contests. We had more people sign up with us again and again because they were hungry for more knowledge. And it was all the weird things that we all know happens with low carbohydrate. Like, yeah, they lost weight and they lost a lot of fat, but all of a sudden their skin wasn't itchy anymore or their elbows didn't hurt like it used to, or like they had energy to not take a nap every day or play with their kids after work. There was all these other like crazy success stories that was so cool. And so that was part of it. And the other part of it um, was when we were using those same metabolic carts, like I was telling you about, when we were measuring metabolic rate on people, when people started doing keto, their metabolic rates would magically be higher than normal. Wow. Uh, unexplained. I don't know why, but these people, if they were supposed to be burning based on their age, height, weight, and gender, two th let's say 2,000 calories, they might be naturally burning like 22 or 2,300 calories. And the calories that they would burn would be more from fat. So their bodies were just like weirdly just chewing through fat on its own. And they were reporting that like they weren't that hungry. They didn't eat as many calories, but it wasn't a diet because they weren't starving themselves. The craziest thing, you're going to love this. The craziest thing is what really changed for me was 
we started seeing people transition from ketogenic diets to more like intermittent fasting. Mm. They were eating foods that were so satiating that whether they were trying to or not, they were just going longer and longer periods of time between meals. And now fasting, it's not even that it was easy. It's just what you would do because you're not really interested in food if you're not that hungry. This is where we saw the magic. This is where I was measuring people. I remember one guy in particular, his metabolic burn rate should have been about 1,950 calories. His body was naturally burning 2,600 calories, sitting around, doing nothing, just being himself. And almost 100% of the calories he was burning was coming from fat. And I was like, wow, dude, like this is really good. Like You have to eat now at least that many calories because we don't want your metabolic rate to come down. And he looked at me and he's like, what, what do you want me to eat? Like I'm eating mostly meat and eggs. I can't eat that many calories. And that led me eventually to the work of Jason Fung and his, how he discovered that fasting in particular doesn't lower your metabolic rate. It increases your metabolic rate as your body gets better and better at finding stored fat, all the fat that we have stored up. And so that changed my career drastically. And that's why I do what I do now. Um, I've also changed my ideas around exercise, but as far as nutrition goes, that's what I recommend to people because it, before when I was doing something that almost nobody would succeed at, now I'm doing something that almost nobody will fail at. If you do this program, I'm very comfortable saying you're going to see amazing results and not just weight loss or fat loss, but other things that, that will make your life be so wonderful. So that's more of like the nutrition side of how, why I changed my approach. Casey, okay, so you're based in Utah, right? Um, yes. But you also do online um... Uh, do you take online clients? So why don't you I share do. those details with uh, with people now? Yeah, so um, I do work with people online. Uh, I work with people um, basically through our website. Anybody can book a free 30-minute consultation with us from anywhere around the world. Um, if they just go to our website, which is myboundlessbody.com, and the first thing they'll see is a book now button so they can book with us. And yeah, we work with people online or in person around here in Utah, but we can give you workout programs. We can give you... Um, you know, nutrition tips and talk about other lifestyle things like that. So we work with people in a variety of ways. It's really fun. Thank you, Casey. Now, I loved uh, what you said about fasting and the magic, the magic that happens when someone is fasting. Do you fast yourself? I do. Um, I used to do, when I switched over to a carnivore diet in April of 2019, um, I started out doing two meals a day. It was pretty soon that I found that I wasn't very hungry. So fasting got even easier for me. So I did one meal a day OMAD for quite a while. I was eating lots of ribeyes at night and then really fasting about 23, 24 hours during the day until I got my next meal. And that was great for me for a long time. Um, I think I took it a little bit too far and started to notice that I wasn't getting enough calories in. And so I started to feel kind of the things that we talked about, what, what people feel when their metabolic rate is kind of coming down. They start to feel cold or not very energetic or you know a little bit more hungry earlier in the day. And so I've ended up adding another meal. So I'll typically eat like maybe eight eggs, um, kind of hard-boiled eggs around like noon or one or whenever I get to them. Um, and then I'll have my dinner usually around six and it's just whatever food sounds good for that day. So yeah, I would consider that a fast. You have to be really careful with the semantics of what people call, you know, the difference between intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. I just like the definition of fasting as, as not eating for a, a certain period of time. Yeah. Maybe it's better to call it time-restricted eating, but that would be about 20, 18 to 20 hours a day, I would say, is I, I spend that amount of time not in the fed state. Mm -hmm, which is perfect. Absolutely perfect. Uh, now you online, you are the, uh, you're the beef and beef and eggs guy. <laughs> so <laughs> as a carnivore, as someone who's following the carnivore diet, it's pretty clear what you're eating. So you're basically eating eggs and tons of eggs and, and obviously some form of beef, be it steak or, or burgers. I think it was burgers yesterday. You posted. Yeah. So, because I was having burgers too, and I was just nearly posted mine as a comment <laughs> under yours because I had <laughs> eggs with it too, and it was just so similar to your plate. But yeah. So, do you recommend a carnivore diet to your clients or not necessarily? Anybody who is open to it. I've had a really interesting experience with social media in particular. Um, you know, when I started carnivore back in like 2019. Um, I think, I think I was really excited about it and I shared about it quite a bit on social media. Um, and I think that was really early for the carnivore diet to be really openly accepted. And it ended up, I think being maybe like a little triggering for people. 
I got a lot of hate for it, frankly. Like my friends, friends that I knew would like, would just, they, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even like say I was wrong about stuff. They would just call me stupid or like insult me in, in the weirdest ways. And I, I just, it, it, I didn't like it. I don't, I don't like that type of energy. And so over time, I feel like I just kind of stopped sharing a lot about carnivore diets. We started our podcast in, in on October of 2020. And I thought that was a good way to kind of share the carnivore message out there. But I was kind of like a little bit more quiet until more recently on social media. And I just, I started to kind of share a little bit more, just simple things like, like this very similar to what you do, like pictures of our food. Like this is a normal meal. This is what you can eat. You have permission to eat this way if you like. And I've definitely gotten some hate and I've gotten some, um, some, you know, not so nice messages from some of my friends, but I've also been really surprised with the number of people that have sent me texts or messages and said like, wow, like, can you, can you really do this? I've, I've been thinking about this, but you know, I'm concerned about my cholesterol. Like, are you worried about cholesterol or I want to do this, but I don't know, like, can I have the, you know, pork, you only eat like beef. And it, it's created some discussion with some of my online friends and even strangers, more people have been reaching out. I've been very impressed and really happy. And, you know, it really hit me when I sat down with a former client of mine, this was a week ago, and he's been seeing some of those pictures as well. He offered to take me out to lunch and he was like, dude, you've been doing this for four years. You, you and I have worked on and off together for that amount of time. Why did I not know this? Why didn't you tell me that you were trying this? And I realized like, we got to, we got to get our message out there a little bit more. We got to talk about this a little bit more. And like, yeah, you might not get the most positive messages all the time, but there are more people than ever. I think that are open to a new message. I think people are getting sick of being sick. I'm seeing some changes out there, especially with this younger generation. Like some of the kids I trained that are like 20 years old, 15, 20 years old, like they're pretty sharp. They're pretty smart. They can kind of see what's going on. And they're asking really good questions. I'm getting really optimistic that we might be causing some change. Like platforms like yours are getting this message out there that like you're, most people are very sick. Most people are trying really hard. What's the problem? If people are trying as hard as they are, why are they so sick? It's because of this stupid advice that makes so many people in my industry, in the medical industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the food processing industry, so much money. And if you eat the proper way, you don't need any of it. You can be healthy without the medical system, without, in, in lots of cases, without the pharmaceutical system. You don't need processed foods. You need natural foods. And so, <laughs> yeah, like I, you know, I, it, it's been, it's been an interesting journey for me to share some of this stuff publicly, but it's something that I'm really committed to doing more because I'm seeing that it's making a difference. And I wish I would have done it a little bit sooner and not been afraid of getting some hateful messages that people from people that are just simply not ready to understand. It's nothing against them. It's just something they're not ready for. So, you know what they say, you're uh, if you're ahead of your time, you're going to get hate. And if you're ahead of your time, because, uh, I ha had similar experiences to yours, um, mm. not from close friends, but from total strangers, like from even the doctors or the clinicians that worked with me, uh, Oh, no, no, you can't do fasting. Oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, keto is dangerous. Oh, oh, that's uh, that's not wise. That's not smart. Or, uh, oh, so you don't eat any bread? Um, you know, it can't be right. Oh, you're going to have a heart attack or, you know, all of that. And but that, that was back in 2015. So I remember um, uh, a trip to New York and I was staying with my in-laws and it was the beginning of when I was just, you know, starting to cut out carbs and noticing the blood sugars improving. I said nothing to them. So every evening we'd go out to a restaurant and I was a vegetarian then. So, of course, I'm not eating the meat. I'm not eating the carbs. And there was very little to order for me <laughs> other than just right. a couple of, uh, you know, broccoli sort of florets uh which were boiled or buttered or whatever but i was constantly hungry the whole throughout my trip of 10 days with my in-laws who obviously have plenty of money to spend on food and they were dining out and people were drinking every single night i got back to london totally starved i was starving every night because i was hungry i just there was nothing for me to eat it was partly my fault because i was vegetarian so i wasn't eating the meats and i wasn't eating the carbs 
But the fact was that I didn't say anything because I thought people will think I'm stupid and they won't mm. understand. Now, I don't think that anymore. Now, more and more people are open to, uh, you know, to uh, these uh, sort of healthier ways of uh, ways of living. Another interesting anecdote, I'm sorry, I'm taking up from your time, but it's relevant. No, this is great. You you were mentioning the health aspect, right? You can be, you know, in optimal health when your uh, diet is sort of animal animal food based. So, um, the reason I start I switched to to meat, being having been a vegetarian for thirty years, was because I was deficient in every single vitamin and mineral you can ever name and you can think of. I was deficient in every single one of them, and uh, wow. I haven't had a uh, haven't had them checked since. It's been four years now, I think, four or maybe three years. So uh, now I'm visiting my family. My brother is a doctor. So I asked him yesterday, I said, uh, look, would you give me a, give me a, a, you know, the paper prescription so I can walk to the local lab and have all my vitamin and whatever levels checked. He looked at me like I'm crazy. He said, why? I mean, you're on a pure why? carnivore diet. What, what? Could you possibly be deficient in, you know, three years of eating just meat or predominantly meat? Don't worry about it. That's going to be hundreds of dollars just wasted. So oof, I thought, great, that's good. Even though he's not kind I... of he understands. Uh, I think more and more, more sort of clinicians are now have come to understand uh, that you can be in optimal health just eating meat. Yeah, that's... That's amazing. Again, that's so encouraging for me to hear that your brother is open to that kind of thing. And I also am so happy that that kind of message is getting out, which I totally agree with. Um, I think it was Sean Baker that first turned me on to the idea that like, if you feel good today, what metrics do you need? What, what do you need to see? You don't need to see anything. If you feel good today, you're very likely to feel good tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Why... I know this is kind of debatable, but like, why do we need to see blood? We, we hardly know what's going on in the blood. We know some things, but even the time of day that you take it could change drastically. I tell people like getting your blood work done is like taking a snapshot of the freeway. Is it 3 a.m. or is it 3 p.m.? You know, is it rush hour or not rush hour? There's so many things that are going on. It's hard to interpret. And it's not to say that there's no value in it. And if somebody has gotten blood work, I'm always interested to see it. And I want to know what's going on, certain markers, but the more I do this, the more I kind of agree with your brother. Like, you know, maybe we don't really need to be tracking and watching lots of things. If you feel great, save your money, <laughs> save your money, go on a great trip somewhere and like enjoy yourself and keep eating meat. And I, I totally agree. I think that's a great way to look at it, honestly. And that's, that's, that's why he asked me, he said, well, are you feeling anything not normal? Are you feeling fatigued? Are you feeling dizzy? Are you feeling anything? I said, no, I feel the best I've ever felt. So he said, save your money. Save your money. <laughs> save your money. Um, okay, Casey, I'm, I'm going to give you a few scenarios, sort of completely imaginary sort of character. So uh, we'll, we'll imagine they walk, <laughs> walk your way. What would you advise them to do? So uh, I don't know. So these are completely made up. Right. Okay. Um, uh, they they may, may, may be stereotypical, but at least they will be relevant to, you know, people who might be watching us today. So um, male in his mid fifties, he's overweight, has about 60 pounds to lose. Um, he's not diabetic yet <laughs> it doesn't have any medical conditions funnily enough but he's in his mid 60s 60 pounds to lose uh i imagine him having big belly as well so visceral fat where would you start with him he wants to be healthy. I, <laughs> I i love this this is great this is really going to make me think i love it um yeah so this is a scenario i see quite a bit um this this is a type of person that, in my opinion, usually responds very, very well and very quickly to an animal-based style. So, you know, I, again, I don't tell everybody they have to do carnivore all the time, although I think most people should give it a try at least once in their life to see, um, because I don't think that uh, people understand how good they would feel if they tried carnivore, frankly. 
Um, but but this type of scenario, I think, does really well with it. So I would start with just encouraging him to try to get more animal protein in the diet mm -hmm. and not worry about the other things. If we can start to reduce the carbohydrates in the diet, that will be great. But I, before I tell somebody to, to bring their carbohydrates down, which can be difficult in the beginning, I like to try to bring the other things up. Let's just make sure you're getting really full on the animal products. Do you like eggs? Do you like steak? Most people in that type of demographic love those foods anyway. So it's like, great, focus on those. Over time, I'll try to encourage them to get the carbohydrates to be lower and lower. Um, and then with exercise with that type of person, if we're trying to go for fat loss, there's really two types of exercise that I think are really beneficial for pretty much everybody. Um, and I would say those two types of exercise would be strength training. Um, I want people to be doing strength training primarily, more so than doing you know, an hour of time on the treadmill, I would be a lot happier if you went to the weight room and maybe for 20 minutes, you did whatever machines were comfortable for you, or you were familiar with, or you work with a professional to get you a right program and lifting weights in a way that you get to a point of deep kind of muscular fatigue, where you almost maybe get like a little anxious, a little shaky. You're getting to the point of where your muscles are really failing and you can't really push the weight much further. Obviously, you want to do this safely. You don't want to do this, you know, with free weights. If you've never used free weights, you can use machines or bands or, again, work with a professional who can show you the right form and give you good balanced exercise workouts. But I want your body to receive a signal that says your current level of strength is, is, is not sufficient. It is insufficient for what you need it to do. If you go to a gym and you do three sets of 12 of something and you're on your third set and you did 12 reps and you set the weight down, you go, okay, that's good, but you were able to do it, your body says, great, like all the strength we needed to have, we already have. So we don't need to get stronger. We don't need to build ourselves back up. If you get to the gym and push something to the point you can't really push anymore, you're telling your body like, whoa, your current level of strength needs to go up. And that's when the body has no choice. It has to start making more muscle mass. It has to start making the bones more healthy and more dense. It has to start strengthening the joints and the connective tissue. And that, that is part of how we can get the metabolic rate. What we were talking about before, your calorie burn rate, we can get that to go higher and higher and higher as your body is building up strength. I find that to be the most valuable thing that people can do when they're choosing exercises. I really want people to challenge their strength through some type of resistance training. And again, hire a professional. It's not going to be as expensive as you think. It doesn't need to be for forever thing. It can just be a few sessions to help teach you good form and to teach you a good program that you can kind of do on your own um, if that's what you want to do. The second kind of exercise that I think is really, really important for people for fat loss is movement is, is the way I call it. It's not, it's not cardio the way that most people think cardio. It's, it's not getting on that treadmill and running and huffing and puffing and breathing heavy and sweating everywhere. Those exercises burn a lot of calories, but the calories that they burn, you're working in an, in a heart rate zone. That's too intense to burn calories from fat. Most people are primarily burning a lot of calories, but the calories are coming from carbohydrates, not from fat. That's the way your body works. It uses carbohydrate calories for harder intensity exercises, it uses fat for easier exercises. So I'm trying to get people to forget about the exercises that are going to um, make them burn lots of calories. I'm trying to get people to burn the right amount of calories and burn fat. So I want people to go on walks or easy bike rides. I want them to go on hikes outside if possible in the sunshine and the fresh air. If somebody likes to, you know, skateboard or rollerblade or, you know, I by my house, there's a lake. I take my paddleboard and I'll paddle around the lake. And it's not a very high intensity, but it's that movement it's so good for us for humans, and it's at a level where you're burning mostly fat. It's a lot easier than where most people think to spend most of their time. And so I recommend that people pay attention to the difficulty of their exercise and put it on a scale of 1 to 10. So if 1 is sitting on the couch watching Drive to Survive on Netflix, and 10 is the hardest you could ever go, you're running away from a bear, I want most people to spend their movement time right around a 5. Mm. A five means that you could be breathing in and out through your nose. It means you might be able to have a conversation with somebody. You're certainly moving. 
you're, you know, you're not sitting still. So you might have a light sweat or you might feel like you're breathing heavier than normal, but those types of exercise promote fat burning, not just calorie burning, but fat burning. Another way to kind of think about this is when you are strength training in particular, you're making yourself become inefficient. You're making yourself burn more calories all the time. That's actually inefficiency, which sounds bad, but it's actually really good if you've got extra energy in this form of stored fat, you aren't gone. The more inefficient you are with calories, the more you're going to burn off that energy and have better energy. It's great. Now, if you're running all the time, like I'll give you an example. If I were to do running right now, if you told me to go run a mile, I would burn a lot of calories because I don't run very often. I would be very inefficient and maybe flailing my arms and people would look at me weird and be like, wow, what's, what's that guy doing? He doesn't run. Now, if I were to do that every single day, for six months, my body would naturally become better and better and better. And I would learn how to do that activity more efficiently. My stride would get more efficient. My arm swing would get more efficient. And what that means is I would be able to run that same mile burning less calories. So now I've become efficient. Well, that sounds really good. And it is really good if you're running a marathon or you're doing something where you have to go a long time. If you can burn less calories, you can get through that activity a little bit easier, but it's not a good thing. If you've got extra energy, you want gone. Efficiency means you're burning less calories. We want you to be inefficient, burn more calories. So those two things, the strength training, really challenging the muscles with, with quite a bit of intensity, and then also moving at a rate where people feel like they're at about a five out of 10 for difficulty are the two best things that I would recommend. Yeah, I love your message. I've heard you, I've heard you repeat that on other podcasts as well, that you know, to make your muscles stronger, you have to challenge them. They have to get yeah. the signal that they need to get stronger. Um, I was actually thinking of you the other day when I was at the gym because I was doing exactly that. And I said, oh, that's what Casey was talking about. <laughs> I was training <laughs> with my husband and, and you, so I was on the hack, hack, hack squat machine and it was quite heavy weights. And so I did that immediately followed by a leg, rate, a leg extension machine. And by the end of it, so we did three sets. By the end of it, at last, like I felt like tears were gonna come down my eyes. I couldn't do it anymore, and that was it. I, I was done. Because then my husband says, "Shall we do some abdominals?" I said, "Not that. I'm I'm done. I can barely move now. That's it." So, and, but I felt good. I felt good because I good. challenged the muscles. Now they're gonna grow stronger because they don't respond that quickly when you're in your fifties, right? So. <laughs> That's fantastic. Good for you. It's crazy intense, isn't it? Not like breathing heavy, but like, oh, the, the burn in the muscles is crazy hard. It's very intense. Yeah. The sixth rep, he was saying, you've got two more in you. Go, go, go. The seventh one, I could barely push in. And that was it. I just stopped. I was just, I felt like I was going to cry. And you yeah, feel that's hilarious. Nauseous, but I felt like that's a good workout. So, you know, yeah. I achieve something. It's today. It's funny, my wife and I, you know, we do, we, do, we both do training and we both, I, I work more with people with nutrition. My wife does more like Pilates and she does like tissue work with people who are in pain. So people think like we're a fitness couple and like we work together, we train people. We must be like probably work out together, train together all the time, but we've got totally separate schedules and usually different locations where we're working. This last weekend we were on vacation, but we decided to go down to the, the hotel gym. We don't, we don't get to work out that often. We told each other like, let's train each other through a few exercises. Like you make me go really deeper than I want to go myself and vice versa. I was stunned. I, even knowing all of this stuff, doing these workouts on my own, it, you you kind of, you tend to quit a little bit early, but when my wife was there saying two more reps, two more reps, two more reps, like, no, you're so like ah, burning and intense. And I was, yeah, I was pretty sore the next day. Um, so it's nice to have somebody push you to that intensity, but it's, it's quite effective. And the cool thing is if you do that to that level, you don't need to do it very frequently, usually like once a week, maybe twice, doesn't need to last very long, like 15, 20 minutes. So it's, it's very efficient, but yeah, that. I'm, I'm encouraged that you notice that same feeling. I feel a little better that I'm not alone in the in the pain cave. <laughs> so yeah, and the motivation is really important, right? Yep. Yes, it's absolutely. Important. Are you ready for your second client, Casey? Yes, I love this. <laughs> so she's female in her 20s. She's actually underweight. And she's a vegan. 
She wants to get healthier. She's open to any new ideas, including changing her diet, if that's what you would recommend. She's open? She's open. She's underweight, uh, no muscle mass. She's in her 20s. Oh. If she's open, we'll have a conversation. That's fantastic. I, I noticed that a lot of people um, eating plant-based or vegan, they they don't want to hear anything about it. They they don't want you to touch it. So really great that we found somebody who is open and willing to discuss it. Um, protein, 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 animal protein, any kind. I don't care. It I, She's probably not going to handle dairy well. So eggs... I, I would expect her not to be able to handle well as well, although sometimes that can be a good transition for a vegan to get back on animal products. I noticed that a lot of people, maybe it's just fish or chicken. And you know what? In the beginning, I don't care. They're probably not going to be open to red meat in the beginning, in my experience, especially with females. Um, it, it's maybe not even a health thing, but it can also be like a texture thing where they just they, they can't handle the texture of red meat or they can't handle the fat that comes with red meat. It's It's not... It's not appealing to them at all. So I don't want to start there. I just want to like any, any amount of protein that you can eat, that you can keep down, start there. Once we get the brain turned back on, because I'm assuming that person's going to be struggling um, with their energy. They're also going to be very hungry. They might have uh, you know issues with digestion. We might have to be very mindful of oxalate dumping and things like that. Um, but, but we'll worry about all of that stuff down the road when this person starts to turn their brain back on and starts to feel a little bit better energy. Um, over time, I would like to see them ramp up even further the amount of protein that they're eating. If they're open to, you know, changing, I notice definitely a pattern where if somebody is open to some of those kind of white meats, like maybe turkey or chicken, they'll, you know, appreciate that taste. And over time, it, it, it's so interesting how this happens. I swear this happens to everybody that they, they, they maybe like don't like red meat and then maybe they have a nibble and then maybe it's like, oh, it's okay. And they have like part of a steak, like maybe a lean part of the steak. And then I notice a lot of women start turning into red meat savages. They start craving it. Like they won't touch the chicken anymore. They want the red meat. They want steak. They want fat on the steak, butter with the, with it. Like th their tastes really change. It's very interesting. I don't see many exceptions to that. So that's where I would start with somebody like that. And then for, for, for gaining weight, um, I, we, we want to make sure that we're keep, we're increasing the metabolic rate and we're telling the body to start adding weight. So strength training absolutely would be the number one thing I would get that person started. Their strength might not be great, but it doesn't matter if I don't care if you're five years old, 10 years old, I don't care if you're 95 years old, you can, you, there's something you can do. One of the last people we interviewed was, you know, bedridden at 550 pounds. They gave her a trainer who would train her virtually in an X3 bar with a band. She couldn't even get out of bed, but she would just lift her weights in six months. She lost like 170 pounds. It was tremendous weight loss just from moving a band, a simple resistance band. And, and so th like that works for weight loss, but also for this person for weight gain, protein would be the name of the game, whatever kind we can get them on and any kind of strength training to start to send those signals to the body to add weight. Um, I think it naturally happens when we change our diet. Anyway, it seems like a lot of weight issues correct themselves over time in the body. When it finally gets the nutrients that it wants, it, it feels comfortable to like start to refill the tanks of everything that was really depleted. So bone density gets better. Muscle mass tends to get better. Lean mass in general gets better. You know, if, if somebody is very, very lean and really low body fat, they might notice that their body fat is coming up, not to be like overweight, but just to be like a, a normal regular body fat percentage. Um, most women don't like to hear that, but, um, I think ideal body fat for most women is a little higher than they would, they would appreciate, but, um, those are the things I would focus on for that person. I would not want that person burning lots of other calories from other things. I wouldn't want that person doing any kind of running or cardio. Um, we, we want to focus on the protein and the strength training as much as possible, I would say, but it's nice to meet an imaginary person who is open to not being a vegan. That's great. So for that person, how would you play with the, uh, with other macros, uh, with the carbs and fats, because this person, according to me and my experience would benefit from both in their diet. I agree with you. It's, it's protein is where it would start. Um, I wouldn't start with the other macronutrients. I would just focus on the protein at first and any other thing that you're eating. And in the beginning, 
is like, fine, let's, let's do that again. If this person was really vegetable heavy, I don't want to cut out their vegetables all at once. They might have oxalate problems. Like we said earlier, um, over time, you know, a, a female, I'm assuming even at that age has a potential loss of their cycle, um, associated with that. And so, over time is they're just eating more calories of any kind. Um, hopefully they can recover their cycle if they've lost it. Then we can talk about things like carb cycling that I think works really well with um, premenopausal women and women with their cycle. I think women can tolerate um, more carbohydrates and get away with it than, than men can. I think there's, you know, a good week in the month where most women, you know, start craving a few more carbohydrates. And I don't think they're bad when they're added in. I don't think they need to be a high amount. Maybe it's, you know, a few servings of rice or a few servings of fruit in a day. I don't think that's terribly harmful for a lot of women. I don't think every woman with their cycle has to do a zero carbohydrate diet or a strict carnivore diet. I think that's merited in some cases, but not all. Um, but yeah, in the beginning, I wouldn't worry so much about the macronutrient split. Um, over time, I would start to maybe ask more of those questions and get a better understanding of, okay, where is your fat coming from? What are your fat sources? How about your carbohydrates? Are you eating fruits and some rice, or are you eating, you know, vegetables? Are you eating potatoes? Are you eating Oreos? <laughs> are you eating candy? Those are the things we can dial in over time. But in the beginning, I, I want that person to just have any, any calories that they can get in their body. That was great. That's absolutely great. I'm loving this. Um, this is I, fun. Yeah, I'm loving these imaginary sort of scenarios. But uh, you you said earlier um, about uh, you know start wherever you are in the gym with the strength training. It doesn't the weight doesn't need to be with the with the with the overweight fifty something. Uh, uh, male i think you said you know just start wherever you are do something that you you feel like you can because you know if people have joint pains or whatever i was just thinking about myself because i never stepped into a gym until four years ago uh and it's funny because my husband is a retired uh personal trainer <laughs> And uh, it was always his thing. I never, never joined him, never took interest in working out and, you know, in exercising until I woke up one day with frozen shoulders. And that's yeah. because of diabetic sort of glycation. So high blood sugars, uh, what happens is the glucose molecules actually glycate where they basically stick like glue to the protein molecules and that won't go away. So that's it. So, so you get this sort of gooey sort of, a substance in your in your joints so i had that in my in my shoulders and i couldn't couldn't even put my clothes on i couldn't move my arm to eat um i didn't take any medications no injections not anti-inflammatories and i decided to go to the gym yeah. i couldn't lift my arm at all now i can actually do bench press it. i don't have full rotation in my arms which is quite sad and uh, but uh, but I'm I'm I've made tremendous improvement in literally just three to four years where Amazing. you know move my arms so now you know bench pressure presses with half my body weight I'm very proud of that that's something to do in my good for you you should be very proud that's amazing I'm that's really incredible very proud because it you don't realize how unfit you are and how bad your health is until something big. Yeah hits you yeah. until you yeah. wake up and I agree. Think, you know why can't I move my arm and then yeah. I had no idea what it was and then the next morning I woke up I couldn't move my, my other arm I, I literally could not move them that's so wow. debilitating because you don't expect anything like that you think you're getting away with you know your diet and whatever and then it yeah. just hits you right yeah. We tell our clients to, we tell our clients to imagine putting their hand in a bowl of, of water and sugar together and mixing it around and imagine feeling what that would feel like. That would be sticky and gummy and you, your hands would get sticky. That's like, like candy. And so we tell people like, what happens to sugar when it gets in your body? Like, what do you think? Do you think it's going to be any different inside your body? And so it's, uh, you should be extremely proud to realize that that was a big problem and you need to change what you were doing. And you know what? There's also this other gift of the pandemic, which is like you, we learned in the pandemic that you can, you can use very minimal equipment in very much what I would call less than ideal situations. And you can get a fantastic workout. 
you might use water bottles or seriously like a few months ago i bought a set of bands on amazon for 30 dollars with different thicknesses there were four different ones you hook that up to a tree or some monkey bars or the banister of somebody's stairs or like i just got back from training my last client he's 19 years old he wants to get into the military um and he needs to get strong and so we trained him in his basement literally on this pole that was holding up a heavy bag. We just hooked the band up to this pole and he got a great workout. And to your point earlier, this, this kid, he's, he's such a nice kid, but he's very timid. And so he said to me, kind of this low voice is like, Hey, how, what do you, what do you tell people when they have anxiety, when they go to the gym? And I said, dude, I totally understand when we, <laughs> this area of Utah, a lot of people are surprised to hear this, but this area of Utah is the, the, uh, uh, it's the plastic surgery capital of the United States. We have more plastic surgery per capita than anywhere else. To go to the gym, the corporate gym that I used to work at, you you like have to get done up a little bit. Like women wear their makeup for workouts. They have new outfits all the time for workouts. Like it's very intimidating around here. And so I think a lot of people feel that kind of intimidation. And so part of that is building your confidence, you know, hire again, hire a professional if that's what you need to do so they can show you how to do things that will build your confidence. And then you'll know what to do when you go to the gym alone. And then also understanding that the strength training is so important. You think that everybody's looking at you, but nobody is looking at you. They're all thinking about themselves anyway. So to do what you did and take those steps to do something that was maybe really intimidating or new or different, but start with where you are and learn as you go. And then you're building skills that you'll use for the rest of your life. I think that's such a wonderful message now here. I'm so proud of you. It's so cool. Thank you so much, Casey. Let's look at someone else, female in her 60s. Uh, she's not necessarily sort of overweight, but she has a big, uh, large amount of visceral fat. So, uh, you know, your typical sort of uh, Chinese woman in her 60s, they're usually petite, shorter compared to your usual European sort of counterparts. She looks petite, but she has a large sort of belly, right? A big, big, big tummy. Um, diet is poor, carb-based. And she doesn't exercise. She wants okay. to come to the gym. Where do you start? Cool. Yeah, great. So th this is where the gender differences, um, in my opinion, don't make as much of a difference. So a woman that's postmenopausal, I think, um, starts to have a metabolism that's more like a man's. Um, it's not exactly the same, but I think it's closer. And so the results, are, I'm sorry, the, the advice that I would give would be probably a lot similar to, to the first example that we gave with the overweight male. I'd want to try to get more protein in her diet as much as possible. She's probably vastly, vastly under eating protein. Like I recommend for most people that they're eating about a gram of protein per pound of their own body weight. Um, obviously that's different in, in, um, in the, on the metric scale, but somewhere in that ballpark for most people. Um, and she, you know, I find that a lot of women in her case are eating like 50 or 60 grams of protein a day. And maybe some of that is like plant-based. You don't even absorb very well anyway. So again, my advice would be whatever animal protein we can get in her diet. Well, let's start with that. Um, I, I, I don't love telling people to start with restricting carbohydrates because that tends to make them think of the things they can't have. But if they start filling up and adding things, they feel like they're, they're adding additional things what I notice is the carbohydrates naturally just kind of lower on their own because the protein's taking up so much of that space now. So it's really easy for them to not eat as much carbohydrates or even fat than they were before if they're eating enough protein. And then I would really, really try to hammer home the point that strength training is so, so, so critical, especially as we age, not just for muscles, not just for what people think, like they're going to get bulky or they're going to have tons of muscle mass, but really for bone health. If this woman has been eating a carbohydrate-based diet for a long time and she hasn't been strength training, boy, we're, we need to start with that. And let's challenge her with anything we possibly can get to help strengthen the muscles, but also the connective tissue and the bones so that she can live a long and healthy life with her family and age well and be able to do the things that she loves to do. Because I think all of us know once you start getting to that age, 
If you have not taken care of your physical body and your bones, you're not going to have the muscle mass to stop you from falling. And once you fall, your bones are going to be brittle. You're probably going to break your hip or your leg. And that's game over for a lot of people. That's the end. And so we really want to do everything we can to avoid that. So I would try to get that person on as much animal protein as they would tolerate in the beginning. We'll work on lowering carbohydrates later on. And let's get that person doing any form of strength training we possibly can that, that is challenging them, but that they can also feel successful with. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, the, uh, yeah, bone density you were talking about. It's, um, that was um, another reason I started sort of eating meat and working out even more intensely at the gym because when I did a DEXA uh, scan, it's not surprising, 30 years of uh, being vegetarian um, with intermittent sort of veganism, um, my bone density was poor. I mean, mm. I was at a level where they told me, oh, this is classified as osteopenia and you're right on the higher end of it. So if your bones keep deteriorating, then you're going to be diagnosed with osteoporosis. And I thought, wow. okay, I really have to do something about that. Now, um, apparently it can be stopped there and then. So I can stop the progression. And so yeah. this is why I work out. So any tips? I'm your next client. I'm a real person. <laughs> next <laughs> client is me. Any tips? for me to strengthen my muscles and prevent bone mass sort of loss other than what I'm mm. doing heavy meat-based diet and strength training four days a week I, I do, but you know what do you think? I would tell you to keep doing what you're doing you're doing great this is where I find it becomes it becomes really fun to just think of like maintaining you're, you're in a great spot. You've made amazing changes to your diet. You're doing strength training, which I love. The, the process of remaining strong, it's not, it's not like this sexy, exotic kind of a thing. It's just doing the same things on repeat. You need to lift heavy weights. You need to get most of your nutrition from animal products. You need to eat a certain amount of protein. You'd like to get most of your energy from fats rather than from carbohydrates because of the nature of how your body uses those two fuel sources. And you don't want to go out and do lots of exercises where you're just sweating a lot, or there's a big risk of injury, like an exercise where you're like jumping around, juggling things, or like lots of like really heavy overhead things. Like I, I don't, I don't love people doing like really intense workouts where there's a high risk of injury. I would just continue to say, find safe things that allow you to move and challenge yourself, continue eating what you're eating and really give yourself some time to reflect on the, ch the wonderful changes that you've made to your diet and really appreciate how amazing your life can be now that you have great energy and great strength and you get to go explore things and go on hikes and have great energy to show up for things. And you're doing this wonderful work with your show and sharing this message around. Like we're really fortunate to be able to be in this position where we found good advice and we get so excited and lit up and we just want to share it with the world. And so I would just say, congratulations, um, I hope you are very, very proud of yourself. You very much should be and keep doing what you're doing and keep sharing your message. Well, Casey, thank you so much. I'm I'm humbled actually, but yes, thank you so much. So this is why I love guests like Casey because they are doing what they're doing to spread a positive message. It's my mission. That's his mission too. So um, thank you so much for your time today. Any uh, last minute sort of tips to our audience? What can they do today to improve their health? Health. I'm, I'm so glad you phrased it like that. You start today. Do anything today. It doesn't need to be a massive change. It doesn't need to be a life overhaul. But most people have the mentality of like, oh, I'll start the diet next month or I'll do the workout plan later on or you know i start eating my diet changes on monday always like no start with your next meal like when, when you see the pictures that you and i are sharing it's just meat and eggs like you can do that you have you can make that it's not difficult you can try it and just see how you feel if you don't like it don't do it but you know if it's if it's you can't walk to the mailbox try walking in the mailbox if it's doing some squats in place to challenge your muscles that's fine where where you are today 
is not always where you're going to be. You will improve. Things will change over time and you'll make progress and you'll be happier and you'll be more energetic. And those things will change over time. But just start today. Start with the next meal. Just eat more protein, eat more fat, have more animal foods and try to do something today that will challenge you, challenge you physically in a way that challenges your stress. I People can start with that right now. They don't need to wait. They don't need anything complex. They can start with their next meal or their next free 30 seconds to do some squats in the bathroom or something. Perfect. Wonderful message. Casey Ralph, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's always a joy. Thank you so very much for listening to this bonus episode of my appearance on the Low Carb and Fasting YouTube channel. I'm really glad that we were able to record that and that I was able to put it in podcast land. I don't believe she has an audio-only podcast, so happy to share that around and help share her message. As we said in the introduction, be sure to go over to YouTube, check out her channel, the Low Carb and Fasting YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and support her. She's doing great work, like we said. You can also check out the episode that we did with her, and that was episode 437 that we released on April 3rd. 2023. Thank you as always so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. It really means the world to be sharing this content with you and to hear back from so many of you. Uh, this last month in particular, I've gotten a few really, really kind messages from listeners out there, and it just makes me so proud and thrilled to share this with you. And, and we're just so excited for all the guests we have coming up and all the episodes and the backlog that we've already done. So thank you again so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio.